Welcome to lecture number four in the series, The Bible or Tradition. And the title of our subject for today is Jesus and Theological Conflict. Now, the introductory music that you hear to each one of these lectures on the DVDs and on television comes from what has been called the Battle Hymn of the Protestant Reformation. You know, every time that I hear this hymn, which is a paraphrase of Psalm 46 and was written by Martin Luther, uh, I can imagine Martin Luther standing before Emperor Charles V and all of the dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church and uh, pronouncing those famous words at the Diet of Worms with a face like flint saying the following, My conscience is captive by the word of God. Therefore, I cannot and will not recant, since it is difficult, unprofitable, and dangerous indeed to do anything against one's conscience. So help me God. Amen. Those have become the famous words of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms in the year 1521. Now, Protestantism and Catholicism are distinguished in many different ways. But if I had to choose only one word that characterizes Protestantism, it would be the word sola. That's a Latin word that means only or alone. You see, Protestantism believes in sola gratia. That means grace alone. Solo Cristo. That means Christ alone. Sola fide, which means faith alone. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. And soli deo gloria, which means all of the glory for God alone. Now, if you had to characterize Roman Catholicism, you would have to add a little three-letter word, the word and. You see, in the Roman Catholic Church, it is grace and human effort. It is Christ and Mary. It is faith and works. It is glory to God and all the holy ones who have achieved sainthood by their good works. It is scripture and tradition. And so the one distinguishing word between Protestants and Catholics could be summarized by the word and as far as Catholicism is concerned, and the four-letter word in Protestantism, which is the word sola. Now, Ellen White has described the meaning of sola scriptura in the book Great Controversy, page 595. This is how she states the principle of Scripture alone, sola scriptura. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only. There you have the word sola. The Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these, should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Amen. That is one of the best descriptions that I've ever read on sola scriptura, that is, scripture alone. Scripture explains itself. Scripture contains all of the information that we need, spiritually speaking, to get to heaven. Now, Ellen White continues this statement on page 595 by pointing out the severe danger of trusting in the judgment of theologians and so-called so scholars. Notice how she continues this statement that I just read. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads the people to look to who? 
bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as their guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. And I want you to notice the reason she gives why the religious leaders, why the devil would want the religious leaders to dictate what people need to believe. At the end of the statement she says, then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitudes according to his will. Is that true? of what happened in the days of Christ. We've been discussing the Jewish view of tradition in the days of Christ, and we noticed that their view of tradition led the Jewish nation to reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And so it's very dangerous to trust in bishops, pastors, professors of theology, and their concepts. I'm not saying that we shouldn't read what they have to say, but what they say cannot be equalized with Scripture. We must go to Scripture and study for ourselves and see if what they teach is in harmony with the written Word of God. And of course, we have our great exemplar, Jesus Christ, who points out that this is the only way in which we can be certain about what to believe and what to practice. So the question that we want to answer in our study today is, how did Jesus face theological conflicts and controversies that he had with the ministers and the theologians of his day. Did Jesus ever appeal even once to tradition to defend any point of belief or any point of practice? I'm going to tell you from the get-go that there is not a single case in the Gospels where Jesus ever quoted any rabbi or any scholar to defend any point of doctrine, any point of practice. Jesus, as we're going to study, always pointed people to the written scriptures. He never quoted the rabbis. He never quoted the scholars. And furthermore, we know that he did not attend the schools of the rabbis. In fact, he was homeschooled. And the reason why he was homeschooled was so that he would not become defiled with the concepts that were being taught in the theological schools. In fact, in the book, The Story of Jesus, page 30, we find this remarkable statement about Mary's instruction of Christ. It says, God himself, by his Holy Spirit, instructed Mary how to bring up his son. Notice it doesn't say her son, it says his son. The father says, I'm going to tell you how to bring up my son. And then notice what she continues saying. Mary taught Jesus from the writings of the rabbis. No, No, that's not what it says. It says Mary taught Jesus from the holy scriptures. And he learned to read and study them for himself. So Jesus knew Scripture backwards and forwards. The reason why is that Jesus studied Scripture. Now, uh, the spirit of prophecy also tells us that his mother was uh, heartbroken many times when she saw how the religious leaders were opposed to Jesus Christ. And in some cases, she even tried to convince Jesus to go along with the traditions of the elders. And I want you to notice what Jesus said had to say in response. Signs of the Times, August 6, 1896, we find these words. When the priests and rulers came to Mary to persuade her to force Jesus to give allegiance to their ceremonies and traditions, she felt much troubled. But peace and confidence came to her troubled heart as her son presented the clear statements of the rabbis. No, that's not what it says. Notice once again, but peace and confidence came to her troubled heart as her son presented the clear statements of the what? Of the scriptures in upholding his practices. What did Jesus base his religious faith and his practices on? The written scriptures, never oral tradition. Thus, whenever Jesus defended his teachings or his actions, He always appealed to the written words of the Old Testament. He never 
even once quoted or referred to the supposed oral sayings that came from Moses or from the tradition of the elders. We find in the book Counsels to Teachers, page 447, these significant words. Jesus and John were represented by the educators of that day as ignorant because they had not learned in the schools of the rabbis. So if you didn't have a PhD from the schools of the rabbis, you were an ignoramus, according to them. So Jesus and John, that's John the Baptist by the way, were represented by the educators of that day as ignorant because they had not learned in the schools of the rabbis. But the God of heaven was their teacher, and all who heard were astonished at their knowledge of the scriptures. There it is again. They were, they were just absolutely dumbfounded and astonished at the knowledge that John the Baptist and Jesus had of the Holy Scriptures. Now Jesus, as you know, when he was 12 years old, visited the temple for the first time. It was at the period of the Passover. And Ellen White has a very interesting comment about this first visit, and the comment is found in Desire of Ages, page 85. It says there, in every gentle and submissive way, Jesus tried to please those with whom he came in contact. Because he was so gentle and unobtrusive, the scribes and elders supposed that he would be easily influenced by their teaching, because he was nice. They urged him to receive the maxims and traditions. Now here comes one of those key expressions that had been what? Ah, handed down from whom? From the ancient rabbis. But he asked for their authority in holy writ. What does writ mean? Writings. Writings, yes. He asked for their authority in holy writ. He would hear every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But he could not obey the inventions of men. Jesus seemed to know what? The scriptures from beginning to end, and he presented them in their true import. The rabbis were ashamed to be instructed by a child. They claimed that it was their office to explain the scriptures, and that it was his place to accept their interpretation. They were indignant that he should stand in opposition to their word. That's a remarkable statement, isn't it? Jesus always required uh, the defense of any view or any practice based on Holy Scripture. Now what I want to do in the rest of the time that we have together is take a series of examples from the Gospels on how Jesus responded to the Jews when they came at him with objections and they came at him with different comments about what he was teaching. And we're going to see that in every single case in the Gospels, Whenever Jesus answered an objection or had a theological controversy with the scribes and the Pharisees, he always used scripture to defend his point of view. Never tradition or never said, I think or I believe. It was always based on the writings of the Old Testament. Now Jesus set the tone of how he would deal with these objections at the very beginning of his ministry when he was tempted of the devil. As you all know, the devil hurled three temptations at Christ in the Mount of Temptation. I want you to notice how Jesus responded, and I know that you know this, but it's good to read the text anyway, because this is the beginning of Christ's ministry. It tells us how Jesus was going to deal with uh, things uh, from the very beginning of his ministry. Temptation number one is found in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 3 and 4. Now the tempter came to him, and by the way, the spirit of prophecy emphasizes that the tempter came to him as an angel of light from heaven. And he said to Jesus, see, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was thin, you know, and he, he was emaciated. And so the devil says, you know, I've heard that an angel has fallen from heaven, and, uh, and you've got to be that angel by your appearance. He says, but if you're not that angel, then he tells him, to turn the stones into bread. So let's read. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. 
Jesus saw through the devil's comment immediately. He knew that he was not an angel from heaven. Do you know how he knew? Because when Jesus was baptized, a voice came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And now the devil comes and says, If you are the Son of God. The Father had said that he was the Son of God. And now the devil says, If you are. Jesus is thinking, What do you mean? My Father said that I am his Son. Immediately, when Jesus detected the words of doubt, he knew that it was the devil. Now, how did Jesus answer the devil? Notice verse 4. But he answered and said, It is what? There, there Jesus sets the tone. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written. Do you know where that quotation comes from? It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. So Jesus is quoting from the writings of Moses. He's not giving some oral tradition. He's quoting written scripture, what Moses wrote. And then we have temptation number two. The spirit of prophecy says that the devil is still there as an angel of light. He doesn't unveil his real identity until the third temptation. But in the second temptation, we're told, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And Ellen White explains that he wanted to impress Jesus with his great power by flying Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. And now notice, And said to him, If you are the Son of God, once again expressing doubt, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. Huh, interesting. The devil heard Jesus say, it is written in the first temptation. He says, hey, this guy lives by it is written. So let's give him, give him a little bit of it is written. And so the devil says, it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Do you know what? This quotation comes from Psalm 91. But the devil left out a phrase purposely, because he knew that if he put it in, Jesus would immediately detect what he was trying to, to do. And this is a part that was omitted. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep thee in all thy ways. If Jesus had jumped from the temple tower, he would not have been keeping his father's ways. And the devil knew it. So he says, I've got to hide that portion of scripture. Now, how did Jesus answer the devil? Notice verse 7. Jesus said to him, how did he answer? It is written again. Now, a better translation would be, it is also written. <laughs> so the devil says, it is written. Jesus says, yeah, but it is also written. And that quota this quotation comes from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so in the second temptation, Jesus faces the devil in the same way that he did in the first temptation. He says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. A quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. And then we have the third temptation. The devil takes Jesus to a high mountain and shows him all of the kingdoms of the world. Let's read about it in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. And by the way, Ellen White explains that at this point the devil had revealed his true identity. And notice verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! And then what do we have? It For it is written! You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. These quotations come from Deuteronomy 6, 13, and Deuteronomy 10, verse 20, from the writings of Moses. Jesus is not appealing to tradition, to some supposed oral tradition, or the maxims of the rabbis. Jesus doesn't say, I think, or I believe. Jesus answered by quoting the written scriptures. Jesus lived by sola scriptura. Now, I want you to notice how Jesus introduced himself at the beginning of his ministry, after his baptism. Jesus goes to the synagogue. He's asked to do the scripture reading. And he opens up the scroll to Isaiah 61 and verses 1 and 2. And when he finishes reading that passage, he says, and this is in Luke chapter 4 and verse 21, This day is this what? Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? 
So how did Jesus introduce His public ministry? By appealing to what? By appealing to Scripture. Isaiah 61 and verses 1 and 2. Now go with me to John chapter 5 and verses 45 through 47. This is an interesting passage. Uh, you know there's a group of Jews. Jesus had just uh, healed a paralytic. And uh, you know then He had a dialogue with the Jews after He had healed the paralytic. And I want you to know how Jesus concludes His argument. Notice John 5 and verse 45. Jesus says to them, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. So who, who accused them? Moses. Jesus says, I don't have to accuse you. There's one who accuses you. They say, Moses, in whom you trust, is the one who accuses you. And then notice verse 46. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he what? Wrote about me. Is Jesus speaking about some oral tradition that comes from Moses? No, no, no. Jesus is saying, he wrote about me, and then in case that wasn't clear, in verse 47 it says, but if you do not believe his what? If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So if you don't believe his what? If you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So what did Jesus appeal to when he was discussing things with the Jewish nation? He appealed to the written scriptures. Now let's refer to Mark chapter 7. We already discussed this in our last study together. Remember we talked about uh, the concept of tradition and the washing of the hands and the washing of pots and so on. Now I'm only going to refer to this briefly because we did a full study on Mark chapter 7. How did Jesus respond to uh, the objections of the rabbis that he did not have his disciples wash ceremonially, ceremonially as they should? Did Jesus quote uh, contrary views of the scribes and of the Pharisees to say, listen folks, you know, there's another tradition that says just the opposite of what you're doing. Absolutely not. Jesus quoted scripture three times. Isaiah 29 and verse 13 was the first quotation. Jesus says, you know, the prophet Isaiah spoke very well about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then you have another quotation, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as precepts the commandments of men. Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29 and verse 13 when he's in controversy with them. Then a little later on, Jesus speaks about the uh, tradition of Corban. Remember we talked about Corban and how it opposed the commandment of God? Well, Jesus quoted Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, where it says what? Honor your father and your mother. Jesus says, look, the writings of Moses say, honor your father and your mother, but you have Corban as one of the traditions which contradicts that commandment. In other words, your traditions are contrary to the commandments of God, the written commandments of God. Oral tradition contradicts the written word. And then Jesus quotes Exodus 21 verse 17, where Moses wrote, he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. And so how did Jesus face this issue of ceremonial, ceremonial washing of the hands? Did he speculate? Did he say, I think, I believe, you know, other rabbis said something different? No, no, no. Jesus three times quoted scripture as the authority to respond to this particular situation. Now once a scholar, a certain scholar or theologian came to Jesus to test him, in other words he wanted to trick Jesus, and he says to Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to notice in Luke chapter 10 and verse 26 that Jesus answers his question with another question. Jesus says, what is what? Jesus didn't say, well, what do the rabbis say? <laughs> you know, what does the oral tradition that, that is handed down from the times of Moses say? No, Jesus says, what is written in the law? When it says the law, by the way, it's referring to the Torah, the five books of Moses. How do you read? Is this, are these the writings of Moses? Absolutely. And then do you know what the young man does? He quotes Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, and he quotes Leviticus 19 and verse 18, and then Jesus says to this young man, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. So how did Jesus answer this young man? With a question. 
but he, by his question he led the man to quote what? Scripture. To quote scripture, which the two scriptures are Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 and Leviticus 19 and verse 18. You know the enemies of Jesus once came to him and said to him, we can't accept your testimony as being valid and true, because according to what Moses said, there needs to be two witnesses to make a testimony true. Now let's read John chapter 8 and verses 17 and 18 to see how Jesus responded to this accusation that because Jesus supposedly was giving testimony about Himself, there wasn't anybody else giving testimony of Him, then, uh, you know, uh, His word could not be true. John chapter 8 and verses 17 and 18. It says, It is also what? Amen. Written in your law, that is in the writings of Moses, and incidentally he's quoting here or referring to Deuteronomy 17 verse 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 15 where it says that one witness could not, was not sufficient or enough to prove something. And so it says it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And then notice what Jesus says, I am one who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So I do have two witnesses, Jesus says. And I have my witness, and I have the witness of my Father. And he appealed to what? To written scripture to prove his point. Now Jesus had also many Sabbath controversies, as you're very, very much aware. And one of those Sabbath controversies that Jesus had was about the disciples uh, picking ears of corn on the Sabbath. You remember that particular episode? And, uh, and they came at Jesus and they said, why do you allow your disciples to disobey uh, this regulation that you're not supposed to uh, pick ears and you're not supposed to eat uh, uh, th those, uh, what you, you take from those ears on the Sabbath? Well, notice how Jesus answered this. Matthew chapter 12 and verses 3 to 5. But he said to them, have you not what? Yes. There it is, it's the written scriptures again. And he's quoting, by the way, 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 6. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? And so how is Jesus defending his point of view? Defending what his disciples did. He's referring to what? He's referring to an experience that was written in 1 Samuel. He's referring to the writings of the Old Testament. And then Jesus refers to another interesting passage. In the second part, actually in verse 5, Jesus continues saying, Or have you not what? Read in the law, that is the law of Moses, that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Now when it says that they profane the Sabbath, it's because they continued offering sacrifices and, and, and lighting the lamps and doing everything on the Sabbath. And actually they offered twice as many sacrifices on the Sabbath than any other day. And they were blameless. And so Jesus is arguing from Scripture, he's arguing from Numbers 28, 9 and 10, as well as from 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 6, that his disciples have a perfect right to eat the ears of corn that they had picked on the Sabbath. Now you also remember that there was once a dispute between Jesus and the religious leaders concerning marriage. You remember that dispute over marriage? You know, the, the scribes came to Jesus and they said, you know, Moses allowed, to, allowed us to get divorced for any reason. So they're, you know, they're, they're going to actually pit Moses against Moses. And I want you to notice how Jesus answers this particular uh, objection uh, that they bring up. Matthew chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6. Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not what? There it is again, Jesus using the scriptures to, answer, to present his point. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Where does that quotation come from? Genesis 1 verse 27, right? That he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 2 verse 24. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. 
So how is Jesus proving his point to these religious leaders? To the scribes and the theologians and the scholars and the ministers of his day? He's not speculating. He's not referring to what other rabbis said. He's not referring to oral tradition. He says, have you not read in the scriptures? And then he refers to Genesis 1.27 and he refers to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Now you remember when Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, sitting on a donkey? Uh, you know, and the religious leaders, they were saying, uh, you know, you should rebuke those people who are saying uh, Hosanna to the king. You know, you, you shouldn't allow them to say that. Uh, how did Jesus defend the, the people, and particularly the children uh, in that crowd who were glorifying Jesus, who was marching into Jerusalem? Notice, Matthew 21 and verse 16. And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never what? There it is again. Have you never read? He's quoting Psalm 8 and verse 2, by the way. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise. So Jesus is saying, listen, don't tell me that they can't say this because there were already writings in the Old Testament that pointed to the moment when they were going to say this. But Jesus is defending what they're doing based not on oral tradition, or on what has been handed down, or passed along, or received, he's defending it on the basis of Scripture. Now, you remember when Jesus cleansed the temple, right? This is uh, the cleansing of the temple at the end of his ministry, because he also cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry. This is at the end. And in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13, notice the justification that Jesus uses for cleansing the temple. It says there, and he said to them, what's the next phrase? It is there it is again. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He's referring to Isaiah 56 verse 7, by the way, written scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a what? You have made it a den of thieves. Now you remember the parable that Jesus told about the vineyard workers? Remember that there were some messengers that were sent out at vintage time to get the fruit? And what did they do with those messengers? Oh, they killed them and they rejected them. And so God sent out a second group of messengers. Incidentally, this is uh, really telling the story of Israel. The first messengers are between Mount Sinai and the Babylonian captivity. The second group are the ones that are sent out after the Babylonian captivity up to the times of Christ. And so two groups of messengers are sent out, and then last of all, God sends his what? God sends his own son. And he says, they're going to respect my son. But instead of respecting the son, they said, this is the heir. Let's, it, let's take him and cast him out of the city and kill him and take his inheritance. Well, I want you to notice that after telling this parable, Jesus asks the question, what will the Father do to those who threw the Son out of the vineyard and killed Him? This is in Matthew 21, by the way. What, what, will the, what will the owner of the vineyard, the Father, do to those individuals? They answered. They still didn't uh, understand the parable. They indicted themselves. They answered, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And then Jesus quotes scripture. He's quoting Psalm 118 and verse 22. He says, did ye never what? Almost ad nauseum you come to this, this, this way that Jesus faced theological objections. He did not have 150 footnotes in a paper. Quoting the, the opinions, the learned opinions of the scholars. There's nothing wrong with scholarship, but you have to come fresh to Scripture. We have to use Scripture in order to defend our points of view and to defend our practices. So he says, did you never read in the Scriptures? And then he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and... It is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus, once again, is quoting Scripture and applying it to them in this particular case. Now, the Sadducees were an interesting uh, denomination in the days of Christ. Uh, the Sadducees 
only accepted the five books of Moses as being fully inspired. In fact, the Sadducees did not believe that uh, a person uh, had an afterlife. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul, and they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They were kind of fatalists. They believed that when a person died, that was it. And so, you know, they come to Jesus to try to trick Jesus with this scenario of seven brothers. And you know the story, right? Seven brothers, uh, all of them had married a certain woman. Because, uh, you know, uh, one died, and so the next one came and married the woman, and that one died, the next one came and married the woman. So their seven brothers married the same woman. And so they asked Jesus, well, tell us, uh, who will be this woman's husband in the resurrection? <laughs> and, uh, and how did Jesus answer what they were saying? Well, the answer is found in Mark 12, in verses 24 to 27. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, you're so ridiculous. You know, he didn't say, well, you know, what do your scribes or, or, or your uh, scholars have to say? No, no, no. Jesus is going to use scripture to answer their, uh, their, their trick that they're trying to uh, lead him into. And so it says in Mark 12, verse 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the what? The scriptures, the scriptures nor the power of God. Why did he say, nor the power of God? Well, he, he's saying, you don't know the scriptures because the scriptures predict the resurrection. And you don't know the power of God because you don't believe that God is powerful enough to resurrect people. <laughs> so he says, are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures, nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise... Have you not what? So is Jesus going to say, there is a resurrection of the dead? Yes. Is he quoting the rabbis to f defend that point of view? No. He says it's in the scriptures. Notice. Have you not read where? In the book of Moses. Not oral tradition, but in the book of Moses. In the burning bush passage. Incidentally, that's in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. How God spoke to him saying... I am the God of Abraham. Now he's quoting. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now let me ask you, when Jesus said those words, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dead? Yes. They were dead. They'd been dead for a long time. And, and so Jesus says, you know, uh, in the burning bush passage, God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then he says, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. Now, was Jesus saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were living at that time? No. What he was saying is that for God, what is potential is actual. Because God was going to resurrect Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that means that God is the, the God of the living, not of the dead. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not going to remain dead. They were going to resurrect. Are you understanding me? And how did Jesus defend his point of view? He defended his point of view, not on the basis of tradition, oral sayings that have been passed on from Moses. He defended his point of view by referring to what? By referring to the scriptures. Time and again in the gospels. Now, the, um, the scribes came to Jesus when Jesus entered the temple for the last time. And they asked Jesus an, in, an interesting question. It says, while the Pharisees were, actually Jesus asked the Pharisees the question, while the Pharisees were gathered together, this is Matthew twenty-two forty-one. 41, Jesus asked them saying, what do you think about the Christ? The word Christ means the Messiah. What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? In other words, whose son is the Messiah? They said to him, oh, the son of David, piece of cake. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Are you understanding the difficult situation that Jesus is putting them in? You know, who's greater, the father or the son? Let me ask you, who, in, in, in human terms, who's greater, the father or the son? The, the son owes respect to the father, right? The father is greater than the son. And yet Jesus is here saying, why did David call his son Lord? It must be that his son is greater than he is. So the Messiah can't merely be literally the son of David. Are you understanding this point? 
And then notice that Jesus actually quotes scripture to prove his point. He's quoting Psalm 110 and verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So how did Jesus uh, uh, present this case of, the, of him being the Messiah and being greater than David? He did it by referring to Psalm 110 and verse 1 that proved his Messiahship. Now after the resurrection, as you know, Jesus was walking to a village called Emmaus. And there were two disciples, followers of Jesus, that were walking on that road. And uh, Jesus caught up to them and started entertaining a conversation with these two men. And I want to pick up this conversation in Luke 24 and verses 25 through 27. Uh, some very interesting and important information here on how Jesus proved that he was the Messiah, the promised Messiah. It says there in Luke 24, 25, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe in all that the rabbis have spoken. Prophets. Thank you, the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the oral traditions. No, 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 in all of the scriptures, the things concerning himself. How did Jesus prove to these two men that he was the promised Messiah? By appealing to the written scriptures, once again. A little later, Jesus... Uh, you know, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they turned around and came back to Jerusalem, found the disciples in the upper room. They knocked, they identified themselves, they went in, and through the door went someone else, which was Jesus, and they didn't see him. They, he was hidden by the angels like several times during his ministry. And I want you to notice uh, the record as it's found in Luke 24, verse 44 to 47. Jesus says, These are the words which I spoke to you while, while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were what? Written. Written in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the oral traditions. No, the scriptures, folks. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, let me ask you, how did Jesus face theological opposition? Did He argue with them? Did He pit oral tradition against oral tradition? Did He say what the rabbis had said, and what the theologians of His day and the ministers said? Absolutely not. Jesus' standard was sola scriptura, Scripture alone. And in this way, he gives us an example of what our standard should be. Our standard should be Scripture alone. Now, the people were constantly wondering where Jesus had gotten his knowledge and his authority from, being that he had never studied in the schools of the rabbis. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 50, 53 to 57. Now the context of this is that in uh, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has just told a series of parables, beautiful parables, you know, the wheat and the tares and the fishing expedition and, and many other parables, Jesus, the sower and many other parables Jesus had told. And after he told these parables, you know, people marveled at his teaching. Notice, uh, we'll begin at verse 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, that's Nazareth by the way, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished, and said, where did this man get this wisdom? Hmm. This guy didn't study in the schools of the rabbis. This guy's not a theologian. This guy was homeschooled. How can he teach such wise words? Notice, so they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? 
So Jesus had sisters, didn't he? Interesting. Interesting. We'll come back to that a little bit later on in this series. Now notice what, what it continues saying in verse 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And instead of saying, wow, this guy has to be from God, this man has to be from God, they were what? It says there in verse 57, so they were offended at him. And by the way, in the next verse, Jesus says, haven't I told you that a prophet is without honor among his own? They just could not accept the fact that Jesus was the greatest theologian on earth because he had never studied in the schools of the theological experts of his day. Now let's go to John chapter 7 and verse 15. John chapter 7 and verse 15. This was at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, which is the last feast of the Hebrew year. And uh, Jesus uh, went to the temple, and we're told there in verse 15, now about the middle of the feast, the feast, by the way, lasted eight days, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters? Have he never studied? <laughs> had Jesus studied? Yes. Oh, you better believe he had studied. He just had not studied the maxims and the traditions of the rabbis and the theological experts, but he had studied, as we noticed, the scriptures for himself. He could have never quoted so many scriptures in so many circumstances unless he knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. And so... They would ask the question, how does this man know letters having never studied? A little bit later on in the chapter, in chapter 7 and verses 21 to 24, uh, you know, Jesus refers back to the healing of the paralytic in chapter 5. And I want to read those verses because they were still thinking about Jesus healing that paralytic on the Sabbath of all things. They said, this guy has broken the Sabbath because he healed on the Sabbath. Now notice verse 21. Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marveled. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. They say, you, when, when, when in the eighth day, since the birth of an individual comes on a Sabbath, you circumcise on the Sabbath. He says, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And so once again, Jesus is referring to what? He's referring to the law of Moses as he encounters them in this particular situation. At the end of chapter 7, <laughs> you know, the, the, the religious leaders uh, had sent the officers uh, to where Jesus was teaching to arrest Jesus and bring him back. And I want you to notice that these individuals, instead of arresting Jesus and bringing him back, they come back empty-handed. And I want you to notice what they said to the religious leaders. Chapter 7 and verses 45 and 46. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? We sent you out to pick him up and bring him back. The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. They were amazed at his teaching. What gave power to the teaching of Jesus? The power in the teaching of Jesus is that it was based on the word of God, the written word of God. Why didn't the scribes and the Pharisees have any power in their teaching? Because it was based on the traditions and the commandments of men. And with men there is no power. Notice Mark chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. The religious leaders were constantly questioning Jesus to ask him, where did you get your authority from? Who gave you the authority to preach? Notice Mark chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and say unto him, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? And you'll find several times in the Gospels that they're asking Jesus, 
where do you get your authority from? And of course, the answer of Jesus was invariably, I get my authority from my Father through the written scriptures. Now, it is clear as we examine the Gospels that the religious leaders believed that the right to teach was theirs and belonged to them alone because they were the ones that had studied in the schools. They were the ones that knew all of the traditions. They knew all of the ideas that had been passed along from generation to generation. But Jesus said, none of this counts. It is the written scriptures that count. Sola Scriptura. I'd like to bring our study to an end by referring to Matthew 7, 28 and 29. These verses, I've mentioned them before, and I'll probably mention them many times uh, during this series. In fact, the last presentation, number 10, is a study of this parable that Jesus told, which concludes the Sermon on the Mount, the parable of the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand. And uh, I want you to notice that after Jesus tells this parable, of the man who built his house on the rock, and we're going to, when we study this, we're going to notice that building the house upon the rock means building upon the teachings of Jesus that are based upon the Word of God. And building on the sand means to build on the traditions that had been passed along by the religious leaders, the scholars, and the rabbis. So to build on the sand means to build on human opinions, to build on the rock means to build on the sayings of Jesus which are based on the Scriptures. And I want you to notice what happens when this uh, uh, story comes to an end. It says there in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were what? Were astonished at His doctrine. The word doctrine probably is better translated teaching. They were astonished at His teaching. For he taught them as one having what? Authority. Authority. And then Matthew adds, and not as the scribes. Did the scribes have much authority? No, because their authority was quoting other authorities. And you know what? Perhaps even in our own Seventh-day Adventist church, we've fallen into that pitfall. You know, when I examine some of the papers, for example, that are presented at the Theology of Ordination Committee, and you have page after page after page after page of footnotes of what scholars have to say about a biblical text, it makes me wonder. Very little scripture, and a lot of the opinions of other individuals. And human opinions have no power. The power is in the Word of God. Now I'd like to end by once again reading that statement from Ellen White, that classic statement from Great Controversy, page 595. And uh, you know you're going to hear this majestic hymn of the Protestant Reformation, A mighty fortress is our God, based on Psalm 46. And Luther had this severe struggle. You know, and there's some Protestant leaders today that are saying, well, you know, uh, the Protestant Reformation is over. Because the Catholic Church and Protestants believe the same thing on righteousness by faith, that we're justified by grace through faith. But what these individuals are forgetting is that the, the clarion call of the Protestant Reformation was not uh, that man is justified uh, by grace through faith. It was sola scriptura. Because there were many other practices of the Roman Catholic Church which were criticized by Martin Luther and the Protestant leaders. It was not only righteousness by faith. Catholics and Protestants can come to an agreement on righteousness by faith, but there are so many other things, like the Sabbath, like praying to and for the dead, like celebrating Lent, confessing your sins to a priest, getting indulgences. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Things that are based only on tradition and not on the Word of God. This is the statement from Ellen White. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only, see sola scriptura, and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, and the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as 
as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, in its support. Amen. What a majestic statement. And then as I mentioned before, she warns us about trusting the opinions of the bishops and the pastors and the professors of theology, taking them as guides, instead of searching the scriptures to learn our duty from God Himself. And of course she warns that by controlling the minds of the people, the devil can control basically the world. Because if people blindly trust their religious leaders, they'll do what their religious leaders say. So if their religious leaders say, hey, everybody is supposed to keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection, if people don't go to the Bible to study this for themselves, and they simply accept what the theologians say, because they say, hey, these people, they went to the seminary, you know, they've studied this out, and so we can trust what they're saying, and people don't go to the scriptures for themselves to see if it is so. And it applies not only to the Sabbath, but to any other doctrine or to any other practice that we are going to believe in or that we are going to implement in our lives. We must absolutely have as our foundation the Word of God, the written Word of God, the writings of the Old and the New Testament are our foundation rock. And when the tempest comes, which it will come, the house that is built upon the rock will stand. It will withstand the winds and the floods because we are built on the eternal Word of God. <laughs>